This is Polyamory Weekly, episode 600 for June 28th, 2021. Coming up on today's show, polyamorous while Asian. That's coming up on today's show. Hello, everyone. I am your host, Minx. Just me today because we have a fabulous interview with Michelle High, who runs the Polyamorous While Asian blog, Instagram, TikTok, all kinds of stuff. Really looking forward to that. But first, a warning. This is an adult show about really lascivious things like honesty and communication about sex and relationships and inclusion. If you're under 18, please stop listening and visit scarletteen.com. So we actually took a week of vacation in Hawaii, which is super fun, as it always is, and then I'm working remotely for the next two weeks. What's funny is that when I've done this in the past, it's been in January, and so I'm typically two hours behind my colleagues on the West Coast. So I start at 8.30 a.m. usually on the West Coast, so I would start at 6.30 a.m. here just to make it as smooth a transition as possible for my team while I'm working remotely. Well, except that I forgot that Hawaii does not uh, support daylight savings time because, well, I don't need it. (laughs) So now I'm starting work at 5.30. As a matter of fact, I'm starting work at 5 a.m. because I just end up having a lot of meetings scheduled for 8 a.m. Pacific time, and I don't want to say no because then I'm afraid I might not have the opportunity to work remotely again. So... It's been really interesting starting my day at 5 a.m. and try to think that early in the morning. It's a little crazy. But the nice thing is I'm typically done by 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon, which means I can take a lovely dip in the pool and then maybe have an hour or two to go you know, snorkeling or have a leisurely walk or dinner, something like that. It's just really nice, and I do feel super happy and lucky and privileged to be able to do this. Lusty guy of course, has been spending most of his time underwater. He's been diving almost every day to all of his favorite dive sites, trying new dive sites. He and Elle and I have been going snorkeling. Elle is becoming quite the snorkeler, I must say. I am actually having issues with snorkeling because I'm doing something weird with my body, so my neck and back tend to hurt afterwards. I know, wine, wine. (laughs) But we're having a lot of fun, and I'm just feeling super grateful that we're able to travel, that we got our vaccinations when we did, that we are privileged enough to be able to enjoy this for the couple of weeks that we're here. That being said, we'll be back in about a week or so just after this episode goes live, and I'll be very happy to get back to the kitty and the puppy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to have the dog scratching in the background and have the kitty walking across the keyboard, that'll be really nice again. I'm very excited to have with me today Michelle High, who is from Portland, Oregon, and runs the page Polyamorous While Asian, which seeks to normalize non-monogamy through an intersectional lens and amplify the voices of other people of color. She offers non-monogamy peer support sessions and also touches on topics related to body confidence, sex positivity, and more. Welcome to the show for the first time, Michelle. Thank you for having me. (laughs) <laughs> well, I am so excited. I'm so tickled that you could be here. I guess I just want to know, let's start off with what's your poly origin story? How did you come to identify as poly? It's wild to think about because it's almost been a decade, and I think I still have to kind of catch up to the fact that it has almost been a decade. But yeah, I started out in 2012, and I was 18. And wow. it, yeah, it was definitely a trial by fire. I... I was at a Barnes and Noble, a guy hit on me, and so we started talking and whatnot. And over the course of us uh, talking for a bit, he eventually recommended the book Sex at Dawn to me. (laughs) And by this point, like when he recommended that book to me and I saw what it was about, I knew why he was recommending that book to me. He didn't say it explicitly, which which should have been a sort of yellow to orange flag at the Mm. time. I guess him not being as forthright as he could have been about that. But fortunately, fortunately, I suppose, when I started reading Sex at Dawn, things just started to click 
And when I just encountered all this vocabulary on non-monogamy and polyamory, I like misgivings that I'd had as a child and as a teenager around like a conventional romance and conventional monogamy. Like it, it all just seemed to fall into place. And so I was like super gung ho about it. And I was like, yeah, let's do this. I mean, this open or non-monogamy thing, I'm very excited. This really seems to jive with, I don't know what, <laughs> how I view life so far as an 18 year old, but yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so are you still with that guy? Oh, not at all. Okay. I didn't think so, but you know, you never know. I'm yeah. curious. So after you read Sex at Dawn, did you start reading other poly books? How did you fill out your poly education? Yeah. So, so I read Sex at Dawn and then I picked up the book Ethical Slut because mm -hmm. at that time that seemed to be like there these days, there are definitely much more, many more resources and more books but the, I guess I would call it like the poly canon with regard to like reading resources, which is much smaller and ethical slut seemed to be something that was highly recommended. So I picked up that and I think it was the second edition at the time. Yeah. That's yeah. much more relevant. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. Though I know that a couple of years ago they came out with the third edition and I have that edition now. And so yeah, I read parts of the ethical slut and I remember, especially at the time that the website more than two had a lot of information on that, but mostly it was just through practice and through experience because I was like, okay, I think I get the gist of it. Let's try it. <laughs> Learn by doing. Yeah. And then where in all this did you launch Polyamorous Wild Asian? So this was only about a year and a half ago. So in 2020, right before all the lockdowns happened, I thought, hey, I feel like I can be publicly out about being polyamorous. So let's just create a blog of sorts. Even if nobody really reads it or something, I think it might be a good, I don't know, outlet. So yeah, Polyamorous Wild Asian was born. So how does your polyamorous identity and your Asian identity intersect? And are there other identities that I'm not aware of? Oh yeah, um, for sure. I mean, I think... I think our identities, of course, we label them in discrete ways to try to make sense of them and try to make them a bit more clear when we're trying to make sense of them for ourselves and to other people. But yeah, I mean, we all contain multitudes, whether or not we're able to label them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so being polyamorous, being East Asian American, specifically being uh, kinky or bisexual, being a woman, yeah, all those definitely intersect and play off of each other for sure. I'm kind of curious, uh, going back to your launching uh, Polyamorous While Asian, I'm curious if there was a specific motivating factor to that, or if it's just, hey, we got a lockdown, might as well. <laughs> what else are we going to do? <laughs> and also, if there's anything you've learned, I, I find that people who start things that are public, like blogs or podcasts, you often end up learning a lot of things you didn't think you would. So I'm kind of curious about that, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because I... <laughs> It didn't start as like a COVID project, like oh, since I'm going to be in the house, I'm going to I'm going to start that. Like I had just, wow. like I had just gotten back from like a solo trip to Paris. I just was there for a week and a half on vacation, came back, yes. and I I was trying to find more representation of like polyamorous Asians because I just yeah I just wanted to diversify my feeds a bit more, and I'm like I'm here. I know they're out there. But I was really having, I was really struggling, like finding public accounts and people really talking about being polyamorous and being Asian. So I was like, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm polyamorous. I'm Asian. I feel like I have the privilege and the safety with my current situation to be able to be out about it and to be able to talk about it. And I feel like I have like several years of experience and what to do and what not to do kind of under my belt. So I guess I could, I can be the representation that I want to see. I was just thinking that you just uh, be the representation you want to see in the world. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And it's been fun. Like the, yeah, the second part you were talking about, like anything that I've learned and whatnot, like, I feel like at this point in my polyamorous journey, it just seems to be just a fluid part of me. And it's mm -hmm. just a very natural part of me. <laughs> and even though of course the page is called polyamorous while Asian. I would say that the polyamory part of my life is just more of like a background thing. It's just something that happens at this point. And yeah, something that I've learned, I suppose, 
is just really how many people out there are really open to the idea of non-monogamy and are really wanting to try it for the first time or they are trying mm -hmm. it and like they're not alone in all of their like trials and tribulations and like hearing a lot of the kind of pitfalls that happen again and I'm like oh mm -hmm. yep I remember that <laughs> yeah yeah, that's actually why I started the podcast 17 mm. years ago, if you can believe it, because I was hitting all these landmines and, and going like every pitfall. We just like steer right for them. And I started the podcast just because the technology came about and I thought, well, I might as well share it with others. So maybe they won't make the same mistakes that I am making. Mm -hmm. But you're right. You do hear those same things kind of over and over again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it makes sense. And it makes sense because, like, even though there are definitely more resources um, these days, it's still so fringe. And it's like anyone even having the an inkling of a notion of wanting to try something other than conventional monogamy, it's like, where do you even start? How do you, what do you even turn to? What do you even, like, how can you even vet what, like, good examples and representation is? So, yeah. So when, yeah, I, yeah, I see these pitfalls again and again, I definitely don't blame these people. I just wish there were more resources for them. No, what's funny is I almost feel like we're in a space where there's too many resources. I'm, I'm like you. When I started, it was basically The Ethical Slut and Susie Bright did a non monogamy blowout every year. And and there really weren't a lot of other just publicly available resources. And now I feel like there's almost too many and people <laughs> can advise. I mean, there's so many poly Facebook groups and there mm -hmm. are message boards and there are all the books and there are all kinds of classes you can take and coaching. And what I'm seeing nowadays, I'm curious if you see this too, is that people do the research and do the reading, but they get so much information that they're still not sure like what is quote unquote okay. Like, I know I'm supposed to be okay with it, but my boyfriend's partner wants to cut off my leg, and I know I'm supposed to be really okay with everything, <laughs> but I'm not comfortable, and I'm trying to be really good. It's an it's a broad example. But because we're trying to be good poly partners, sometimes we, we just, if you haven't had to play with your boundaries, it can be difficult to figure out what your boundaries are, is I guess what I'm saying. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I definitely agree. Yeah. I definitely agree. And, and, and every, there are so many different types of non-monogamy and so many different ways to approach it. And of course, not all like practices resonate with everyone. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I definitely agree with like, there are <laughs> actually a lot of places that people can get information. And I definitely encounter people who uh, get like almost like stuck in the theory and stuck in the hypotheticals. And because the, because practice is, can be hard to find, especially like this past year, it was definitely hard for a lot of people who like wanted to start try, trying polyamory and then boom, everything was shut down and COVID happened. <laughs> um, I have no idea how people yeah. dated in the last year. Like I know people that did mm. it. I have no idea mm -hmm. how. I like a lot of virtual dates, a lot of virtual dates, a lot of texting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, like, it's hard to uh, sometimes apply the theory into like practice and because yeah a lot of the times we can read everything that we want we can listen to all the podcasts that we want we can yeah think about it and make up scenarios in our mind all we want but like sometimes we just won't know until we try it which can be really scary and sometimes mm -hmm. depending on circumstances like people just don't have as much access to like fellow polyamorous minded people or other people that are open to the idea at all yeah Right. And especially when the whole world's closed down, it's hard to make those mistakes on a small scale. I want to go back to this idea of Asian representation in poly communities because, I mean, I've been in, in and out of poly communities for 17 years, and I'm straining to think of very much... Asian representation. I can think of one or two friends that are Southeast Asian, and that's pretty much it. So I'm wondering if you have any advice on, and I know it's terrible to ask a person of color for their advice on how to be a better ally, but I'm going to ask a person of color on your advice on how to be a better ally and how folks like me and, and folks who are who host their own poly communities can get more visibility for people of color and for Asians in particular. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, this is, right, this is, that is the question. Like, I I talk about this a lot, but yeah, I live in Portland, the, like the whitest major it's city so white. It's in the so United white. States. And so, of course, the polyamory community as a subset is super white. And I would often be one of the only people who, like, wasn't white at meetups and whatnot. And for my part, like, I am not like a community organizer type. I mm-hmm. definitely am more of like the wallflower type and tend to be more on the sidelines in a lot of cases, which can, I, I guess, can seem contradictory that I have this like Instagram page in which I'm like talking about this all the time and people look up to me, which is still really weird to think about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but yeah, when it comes to like organizing, so like, as I understand it, like there, it's more than just like little steps that have to be done. I think it is a lot of like mindset change and a lot of, I think, really embodying a kind of a different mode of moving through the world because... Yeah, it's not enough just to have like POC only nights or something in polyamorous communities or singling out POC. It's really creating an environment as a whole that not only includes marginalized folks, but like actively integrate and is like created by marginalized folks as well. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah, because like if there's like a dominant group that they were here from the beginning and so they've carved out this space and like of course the way they've carved it out kind of benefits them the most and even if they don't intentionally exclude folks like just the fact that created it in a way that benefits themselves it just happens to make others not feel included yeah so i I, so i think in a lot of ways sometimes like to kind of start from scratch is necessary a lot of the time so that you're not just like trying to tack on inclusion into these spaces. Yeah. And it's really tough for organizers. I mean, I'm, I will own my shit and say my podcast until basically until Trump became president was asterisk. No, he didn't was really (laughs) not inclusive at all. And I was embarrassed and humiliated when I went back and looked and thought almost everybody I brought on the show was white. It wasn't on purpose. Didn't even realize I was doing it. It's that unconscious bias, right? So I've been making efforts, but always looking for ways to improve. I am actually curious about some of the nomenclature. You use the term polyam as opposed to polyamorous. And I'm wondering if you can tell me what that term means to you that polyamorous doesn't or non-monogamous or open or solo poly or any of the other terms. Yeah, so I I do identify with the term polyamorous and at this time solo polyamorous. And generally, most of the time I've made it a practice that when I am abbreviating polyamorous, I'll abbreviate as polyam instead of poly because like, I think even before like polyamorous community kind of used the abbreviated form poly, like there was like the Mm -hmm. Polynesian community that uses that abbreviation. And so, yeah, yeah. So I've made it a practice because some people also use like, especially when you're, they're writing it down poly a or poly poly. I'm not exactly sure how you would like say it out loud, although I know some people do. So yeah, I've just made it a practice to just say poly and because a lot of the vocabulary in non-monogamy like non-monogamy or ethical non-monogamy or consensual non-monogamy is just a mouthful so yeah polyam is just a shorthand just an abbreviated form for polyamorous Gotcha. Also, as I figured out a couple of years ago on Twitter that I always did hashtag poly, then you mm-hmm. also get all kinds of posts about polyurethane, polystyrene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. So, yeah. And then you have to do hashtag polyamory, which is just long and takes up all your space. So I hear that. So I'm curious. You've been doing this for a couple of years now, polyamorous while Asian. Are, what's next for you? Are we going to see a book? <laughs> to be honest, I'm just kind of like flying by the seat of my pants. I, this really just started out. Oh, awesome. As... <laughs> it's so nice to meet somebody who's not actually trying to build an empire. You just, you did what I did. You just started something because you thought it would be interesting and valuable and, and, and went off. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. And I've definitely, 
I, I'm just having fun. I'm having fun and I'm taking it a day at a time and I really do like helping to like raise awareness and spit out these like little nuggets of wisdom here and there to help people feel more seen and heard and more validated and so that they don't feel so weird like oh maybe I want more partners but am I greedy? Am I like just a deviant? And it's like no, people are out here doing it. So yeah, I, I don't even, ha I don't have like long-term plans for this. I'm just going as it's going and I'm just going to continue evolving with it and it's just going to turn into whatever it's going to turn into and my my main concern is just like staying as grounded as possible and and having fun like if I ever stop having yeah. fun that'll be the day that I know to stop that was my mantra as well. If I stop having fun and or if people stop writing me and saying that it's helpful and useful, then, you know, I would gladly hang up my podcaster hat and get my nights and weekends back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I do have to say, in terms of the tidbits you provide, I looked at your TikTok and I love your polyam Asian auntie section or auntie, <laughs> depending upon how you pronounce. So yes, it is super mm -hmm. fun. They're very wonderful bits of wisdom. So I recommend that everybody go to your Instagram. Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, which we'll provide those links at the end of our interview. So as we come to a little bit of a close, I'm curious if you think there, what do you think we, the royal we, <laughs> myself and our audience can learn from your experience as a polyamorous person or a content creator? Yeah, I would say that, so non-monogamy for me is a mix of orientation and lifestyle. And mm. for me, it is more than just how I do romantic relationships. And it really has become infused with the way that I do life and approach life in general. And it is really strongly tied to like my values and my politics as well with regard to creating community and supporting one another and like through, through practices like mutual aid and whatnot. Like I feel like practices with regard to non-monogamy and expanding the way that we do relationships and connections really just ties in to all of that. And so I would like to remind people that like relationships, all relationships are political, whether or not they feel political, because like politics is just us deciding how we relate to, with one another and how we feel that power should be distrib distributed. And so like non-monogamy can be really fun. Like a lot of it is about having fun and living a more like pleasurable lifestyle or a more satisfying lifestyle. But at the same time, I think I would urge people to look at like the bigger picture as well. Not that they have to have the weight of the world on their shoulders as they navigate non-monogamy, but I would encourage people to like I think really expand the way non-monogamy and like the practices and lessons in non-monogamy out into like their broad, like the rest of their lives and see how that interacts and really making sure that it all aligns because yeah. at the end of the day, it is about community. Agreed. I mean, the personal is political. It's really hard to separate those two, especially these days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michelle, it has been absolutely wonderful talking to you. I hope you will come back and join us another time. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me on. And in the meantime, where can folks find you and your work? Yeah, I am primarily on Instagram, at polyamorous while Asian. I'm also on TikTok a little bit. I am not an avid video content creator, but I am on TikTok, at polyam while Asian. And you can find me on YouTube under polyam while Asian as well. Awesome. Michelle, thanks again for joining us today and for putting up with the schedule dance. We did have to reschedule, but only once. <laughs> Thank you so much. It has been an absolute delight to chat with you. You're very welcome, and thank you as well. And thanks again to Michelle for joining us today. Super excited to have all kinds of guests on the show, and I just met Michelle, just became familiar with her work, and I'm super excited. As always, if you have any guests that you think would be beneficial to our audience or that you'd like to hear on the show, call 802-505-POLY, email polyweekly at gmail.com. Um, or if you need to book us for anything that involves a calendar, email lustyguy at polyweekly.com. Our first feedback today is from Friggin' Limey, a.k.a. Rich, one of our early podcast listeners, who writes, 
I was glad to hear you once used the phrase relationship orientation. Being an ambiamorous straight cis male, I've struggled to explain to monogamous women that polyamory is not a sexual orientation, but a relationship style slash choice. But I'm amazed at how many who are not yet poly still don't get this. And even the word ambiamorous, when explained to mono people, can sound like I can't make my mind up. That's the challenge with that ambi prefix, is it can make you sound wishy-washy, even though that's not what it actually means. He continues, I realize that I can be poly or mono, but never the two simultaneously, as that seems like a contradiction to me. Anyway, as always, thank you both for such an amazing and informative podcast. Hi there, Minx. I want to begin by thanking you for your podcast, for your time, and for your wisdom. I began listening to you in 2016, and by 2018, I had listened to every single episode at least once. I was also a poly playmate for 18 months. You have helped me so very much in my pursuit and teaching of polyamory. I sincerely value your viewpoint and your advice. I actually really love you a lot. I know you have been playing a lot of positive feedback about your political segment, so I just wanted to offer a dissenting viewpoint. Before I do, know that I stay up to date on politics and read and discuss the issues regularly. When I listen to your podcast, I am ready to learn, relax, and have fun. Listening to you is a way that I unwind and prioritize what's really important in my life, which is my partners and my career. I teach critical thinking and composition. One of the topics I introduce my students to is ethical non-monogamy, and I crave your perspective. I recommend your podcast to my students every semester, as well as your book, because I view you as an expert on polyamory. While I admire and respect your desire for change and your interest in politics, I wish you would start a new podcast to discuss that stuff. You always leave me wanting more. So to allocate part of your podcast to talk about anything other than poly is disappointing to me. Nevertheless, you can do no wrong and I, and nothing, nothing will make me stop listening to you. Thank you again, Minx, for everything you do. And our next bit of feedback is from Jen, thanking us for episode 598. Jen writes, I'm going through an end of a 16 year relationship slash marriage and have been racked with all kinds of emotions. Why do I refer to episode 598? We were kitchen table poly for the last three-ish years and in various forms of ethical non-monogamy before that. What Matthias wrote and your responses echo scarily to what brought the end of our marriage and triad. I came to similar conclusions solo, they did not, and now I suppose my husband is gaining his mono life back. I'm currently happier in another state near my family with the FWB. What I hadn't been was free of guilt for leaving that relationship, and what I hadn't acknowledged was that we had been together half our lives and that the growth we had together is amazing, and the end of our marriage isn't a failure. I just really needed to say thank you. Thank you so much for giving me much-needed advice and perspective. Truly, this comes from the bottom of my heart, Jen. Oh, thank you, Jen. Time for your happy poly moment of the week, brought to you by Fubbly Polyamorists Everywhere. This week's happy poly moment is from G, who wrote us through Poly Weekly's Facebook page. I am solo poly and all of my relationships are long distance. A few weeks ago, after a long and challenging winter apart, I got to go camping with Elle. Peacefully doing nothing together out in the country, even with pouring rain most of the day, was so grounding and lovely. Geographically, our camping spot was close enough that on the second evening, my partner D and Elle's good friend for years before we met, was able to join us too. Talking and laughing with two of my loves by a campfire under the stars, well, my heart didn't actually explode, but it felt like it could have in the absolute best way. Thanks so much for all you do. Binging on old episodes is my favorite background for getting tourists done. All the best, G. Thank you, G. And thanks to our Poly Weekly Playmates for their generous donations this and other months. We are a free resource. We've helped hundreds of thousands of people navigate their introduction to and continued success with polyamory. Those donations keep this podcast free for everybody both inside and outside the community. And your feedback keeps the host very happy. You know, we don't get paid, but we get paid in ego strokes. And I'll take that. 
Thanks so much to everyone for listening. Thanks, Michelle, for joining us today. And remember, it's not all about the sex. <laughs> <laughs>